A warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining Tenancy Deposit Scheme latest webinar. Today we are pleased to be joined by Kira Ward, Senior Adjudicator at TDS. I'm really looking forward to today's webinar which discusses the topic of renting to students. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Amy Maxwell and I'll be your host today. As always, before I hand over to Kira for the presentation and our Q&A session, I'd just like to highlight a couple of the features available in our webinar platform. Please feel free to ask questions in today's webinar. Please use the questions icon on the webinar dashboard. Kira and I will review all of the questions at the end of your presentation and do our best to answer as many as possible. Our webinar platform also allows you to make notes. Look out for the icon which shows a piece of paper with a pencil on top. In the unfortunate event that you do experience any internet or connectivity issues, please try to refresh your web page in the first instance. If for any reason this doesn't work, please close the webinar in your internet browser completely and click back onto your webinar reminder email. Hopefully this solves any issues that you may have. That's all for me from now. A warm welcome to anyone just joining us. I'd now like to hand over to Kira for the presentation. Kira, over to you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and welcome all to today's TDS live webinar. My name is Kira Ward. A little bit about myself first. I'm a senior adjudicator with TDS, and I have been for almost the last 10 years. Prior to that, I worked in tenancy deposit protection for a number of years with a particular focus on uh, dispute resolution and adjudication. So moving into today's presentation, we're gonna be looking today at renting to students from an adjudicator's perspective. And so the topics we're gonna be looking at today will be types of deposit claims, how an adjudicator will approach those claims and reach their decision, um, we're then going to look at some typically seen FAQs on the subject, and then we will move into the Q&A session. So, as Amy mentioned, um, you can submit your questions on the subject during the course of the webinar by clicking on the questions button within the platform, which I understand is on the left. Um, and we hope to then um, be able to get to as many of your questions as possible at the end of the session. Okay, so moving now into our topics. Um, and firstly, um, I'm going to run through what types of claims uh, a landlord may be able to make against a tenant's deposit. So an these are those that an adjudicator will be able to consider, um, primarily at the top there. And one of our most common claims, not least in student lettings, is for cleaning costs. An adjudicator will also be able to consider claims for damage to a property or its contents, uh, cost of redecoration and of gardening. Missing items uh, or belongings or items which have been left behind by tenants at a, at a property can also be considered um, to be claimed against the deposit. The latter of those we are seeing quite a lot of at the moment, given the recent circumstances of lockdown, um, with tenants having to have left in a hurry, perhaps. Um, and an adjudicator will also be able to consider uh, awarding rent arrears from a deposit. So whilst these are not exhaustive, um, these are the types of claims we most regularly see. Um, and that we are able to consider making an award for from a tenancy deposit. So moving on then to the types of claims which are not allowed. Um, and by that, I mean that an adjudicator is not able to make an award from a deposit in respect of these. Um, firstly, any costs involved in raising or making your claim. So for instance, that might be, be a, uh, an amount in relation to collating your evidence or an hourly rate for time spent you might like to charge. Um, but that's not something a tenant's deposit can be used for. TDP, the Tenancy Deposit Protection Legislation, uh, does require that the schemes ensure that the ADR process is free at the point of use. Um, and this doesn't mean that agents or landlords may not have an arrangement between themselves as to fees um, for evidence preparation or handling a dispute. But what it does mean is an adjudicator will be unable to make an award from a deposit in respect of such fees or costs. Um, we're also unable to consider costs that aren't are not covered within the tenancy agreement. Um, so those by their very nature are gonna fall outside of the scope of the tenancy deposit. And I should highlight here, um, of course, the tenant fees ban, which came into effect last year on the 1st of June, 2019, with a transitional period which ended on the 31st of May this year. And that prohibits fees being charged to tenants except in a limited number of um, instances. So it's important to be familiar with that ban and the reach of it. Um, thirdly, amounts in excess of a deposit, again, will fall outside the scope of a tenancy deposit because an adjudicator will only be able to award up to the amount of deposit protected. Um, it is worth clarifying, a landlord can raise a claim with TDS for more than the deposit amount if that's 
the scope of their claims, although an adjudicator will only be able to award an amount up to the deposit amount. Um, if a landlord is hoping to claim more than a deposit from a, depend from a tenant in respect of breaches of the tenancy agreement, um, they, might, they should be aware they may need to do so by other means, such as court action. Also falling outside of um, the remit of TDS would be claims for compensation for issues such as distress, annoyance, inconvenience that I've listed there. Um, you might feel that these have been experienced during, during a tenancy, but, but, but they're not something that can be claimed from a deposit. And finally, um, counterclaims. TDS adjudicators are not able to consider counterclaims. So um, by that, a counterclaim um, is, for example, when a tenant has raised separate issues which may have occurred during the tenancy in defence of a claim against their deposit. So to give a, an example, um, they might be aware that they owe rent arrears and that would be a justified claim against their deposit. So in defence of that and in order to perhaps they may feel to offset that amount coming from their deposit, they might raise claims in relation to faulty boilers or a period of um, time where they lacked hot water during the tenancy. Um, and issues such as these uh, will have to be dealt with outside of the scope of the ADR process. And that is because a tenancy deposit is held specifically in respect of uh, the security of the tenant's obligations under the tenancy agreement. So that falls outside of, of our scope as, adjudication, as adjudicators. Um, OK, so moving into the next slide, we're now going to look at how an adjudicator will approach, um, will approach a dispute. The ADR process is the documentary evidence-based process. So what's crucial is that you have the necessary written and documentary evidence, um, including any relevant clear audit trails uh, from during the tenancy. So number one, the necessary piece of evidence an adjudicator will be looking for is uh, the relevant tenancy agreement. And that sets out uh, initial, well, the initial details of a tenancy, so the parties, the property, the term, uh, but as well as that, the, the rules of the game. So the the obligations that both parties have agreed to. But importantly as well, a tenancy agreement will set out the purposes for which uh, it's been agreed a deposit could be used. Next, check-in and check-out reports also crucial because they are considered primary evidence of the condition and cleanliness of um, a property at the start and end of a tenancy. And those will show an adjudicator by comparing those reports, any level of change in condition, uh, any deterioration in cleanliness or decorative condition between the start and the end of a tenancy. Photographs can be very useful, uh, particularly where they're supporting um, findings in a checkout report in, re in relation to damage, in particular gardening claims, um, and whether they're embedded into the relevant check-in and check-out report or um, submitted as standalone photographs, either is acceptable. Um, but where they are standalone photographs, it's important that they're clearly dated and labelled so the adjudicator knows exactly what they are in relation to. Um, next relevant quotations, receipts and invoices. So supporting the amount or amounts you are claiming from a deposit, deposit is very important. Um, and those that evidence can include estimates, quotations for replacements, um, invoices for work done. However, um, whilst this evidence will help an adjudicator quantify a loss that a landlord may have suffered in relation to a breach of the tenancy, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that an adjudicator will award exactly that amount. Um, that's shown in the invoice or the quote. And that's because they're making an, an assessment for themselves um, based on the evidence they're provided with as to the extent of the loss and the reasonableness of the amount that's claimed. And they're gonna, the adjudicator is going to take into account a number of factors, which we'll, we'll come on to um, a bit later. Uh, nevertheless, evidence such as quotations and receipts, they are useful as a benchmark and the adjudicator will look at them. So emails, texts and screenshots is the next one there. And they're, again, very useful, but particularly where there's been an agreement made or, or there's been an issue raised during the tenancy, which has relevance to the claim. So the adjudicator can take that into account. In particular, we often see email correspondences being passed that are relevant to the claim. Um, and as we're focusing on student lets today, I think it's important to highlight that where a landlord has let rooms in the property on an individual basis and not a joint tenancy basis, um, then an individual record of the cleanliness and condition of each of those rooms, um, as well as any communal shared areas, should also be recorded in writing at the start and end of a tenancy. Um, and you should also be considering what obligations you might wish to include in the tenancy agreement in relation to such individual spaces and, and then communal shared areas. So having looked at the types of claims uh, that we can and, and we cannot 
consider and recommended evidence and requ required evidence. Um, we're now going to look at the, how an adjudicator will approach um, how much they'll be able to award to a landlord. And that's assuming first that the evidence has supported the landlord's claim that a breach of tenancy has occurred and there's been a related loss. So the first principle uh, we're going to look at is the that of betterment. Um, this means effectively a landlord cannot be placed into a financially or materially better position at the end of a tenancy than they had been at the tenancy's start by way of an award from a deposit. Um, so the considerations uh, that the adjudicator will be looking at in respect of this will be, um, for instance, in relation to a damaged item, the age of that item, its condition at the start of a tenancy, as well as a, an approximate average lifespan for an item of that type. Uh, as well as the length of tenancy and also the nature of occupation. So uh, in relation to students, um, that will be relevant. You know, often there are uh, multiple numbers of students sharing one property. Um, and all of these factors are going to have an impact then on the level of award, which is considered to be reasonable by the adjudicator. So further to this and, and uh, is the concept of fair wear and tear. Um, I've set out there on the slide the definition um, for us all, which is the reasonable use of the premises by the tenant and the ordinary operation of natural forces. So what that means is items will deteriorate in condition. Um, it should be expected that some may break or be damaged through, as long as that's through ordinary use. Um, and that's also gonna depend on the nature of use of that item. Um, so it's in, important to bear in mind that in mind when claiming. Um, also relevant to say here that fairer and terrors doesn't apply to cleanliness, where we have a standard of cleanliness at the start and the end, fairer and tear is not um, taken into account. Okay, so um, once those factors above have been considered, an adjudicator will then look at what they can do by way of a remedy. So by that, I mean um, in how they would make the award. So generally, there are three remedies available to an adjudicator, um, repair, replacement, or compensation. Uh, repair in the first instance is often the most reasonably costed remedy, and that um, should be pursued where it is um, the most inexpensive. Um, which to, to show that would show that a reasonable approach is being taken. And this is because the replacement of an item will usually only be considered um, reasonable by an adjudicator where it's the item has been so severely or extensively damaged that its condition makes it unusable or, or uneconomic to repair. Um, so when considering a justified claim for replacing an item, an adjudicator will take into account whether it could have been repaired or for instance, cleaned if it's a carpet um, and will then um, decide upon a reasonable contribution to which the tenant may make in respect of replacing that item. Uh, finally, compensation. Now that can be considered appropriate in the alternative where either repair or replacement are not justified or appropriate. Um, and that award will effectively be made in recognition of the loss suffered. So uh, by that, I mean the loss suffered in aesthetic value or in lifespan of the item as a result of the damage. The adjudicator will look at the most appropriate remedy um, and they'll look, they'll have reference to what um, the evidence is telling them uh, and also whether the cost has been uh, mitigated in, into a reasonable amount to deduct from the deposit. So now I think we are going to move into our SNAP poll. Uh, so I'll pass over to Amy, who's going to take us through that. So as Kira just mentioned, we've just opened um, a snap poll. So we'd love to know, has the COVID-19 lockdown affected student lets? So I can see lots of votes coming in. We've got the majority of people saying yes, um, a few votes saying no. Um, we've got about 20% saying no, um, but a lot of people saying yes. So I'm just going to leave that up there for a few moments, just to let everyone cast their votes. Um, We'd really love to know if it has affected affected your student lets. Um, obviously, it's affected the property industry massively. Um, yeah, so I'm going to publish those results now. So, Kira, you should be able to see we have a 75%, 25% split. Yes, um, and I think that that seems to bear um, bear true to what we've experienced in terms of dispute. You know, it, the lockdown COVID-19 has affected everybody, hasn't it? And um, not least our student lets and with, with universities closing at the end of last term. Um, so yes, that's really interesting to see that those results. 
Um, thank you, Amy. Um, and now we're going to move into um, our FAQ. So let's move into those. And, and these we've um, I've prepared in respect of commonly encountered issues uh, in relation to student let. So these may be familiar to you as a current or previous issue. So hopefully they'll be helpful to consider here today. And firstly, number one, one of my five tenants wants to leave but has found another student to replace them. How might this affect the joint deposit? Okay. Um, now this. Um, Scenario is something we regularly see as part of the disputes we deal with and more commonly referred to as a tenant swap. And that may occur during a tenancy or, or, um, uh, or is being proposed, well, generally during the tenancy. Um, the important issue here is to ensure that the swap is clearly documented. So that will either mean um, issuing a new tenancy agreement for the new combination of tenants that remain in the property or an addendum may be appropriate to uh, the addendum to the original tenancy agreement, and that should cover the switch of an outgoing and incoming tenant. Um, the audit trail is important, um, but it also would need to uh, be, be covering the inventory report. So that would have been issued um, at the start of the original tenancy. It's not usually practical to have all tenants move out and back in so that um, a tenant's uh, inventory report can be redone. Uh, it might be during a, perhaps a summer break scenario um, if the tenant swap is occurring as part of that, but otherwise, you know, we recognize it's not, uh, it will often make more sense to include um, a clause in the new tenancy agreement or addendum, which has the remaining tenants agree, or rather even just the incoming tenant agree to the original in inventory report. Um, and where appropriate, you may wish to give them an opportunity to submit any necessary amendments or additions in respect of the condition um, or cleanliness of, of the property or the room that they are taking on. Um, but as part of that, it might be that the outgoing and the incoming tenant making the swap will make some arrangements between themselves for damages or, or issues that the outgoing tenant would be responsible for. Um, and that can be done at the time of the deposit administration. So we we'll move on to the next one, which um, is my four student tenants have fallen out and three blame one tenant for the damages at the end of the tenancy. Will the deposit still cover my losses? OK, um, uh, it can be commonly misunderstood that joint tenants are separately responsible for their room or their share of the rent. But um, where you have a joint tenancy agreement, uh, that will be on a joint and several liability basis. So that means that all tenants are responsible for all of the obligations and including all of the rent that's due. And what that means that if there is um, uh, a breach of the tenancy agreement uh, in respect of damage, as, um, as this circumstance sets out, then um, whilst the tenants may wish to come to their own agreements as to who will cover what share of that charge for damage or cleaning or, or whatever it may be, it remains that the joint deposit is held in respect of a joint tenancy agreement. And so it can be claimed against for a relevant um, breach of the tenancy agreement. As I said, any sort of inter-tenant um, dispute um, will be between them to resolve and they may come to an agreement about what portion comes out of what share of the deposit when they um, reach that point. So our third FAQ is um, my student tenants university shut down during COVID-19 crisis. So they left. I agreed to defer part of their rent during lockdown, but now one tenant refuses to pay or agree for the unpaid rent arrears to be deducted from the deposit. Now, this is an all too familiar scenario, which we are seeing at the moment. Um, we have been seeing cases in which the tenant believes they're not responsible for the rent remaining under a contract um, or for amounts that they had not paid, perhaps at the moment of returning home during the, the pandemic, the, the main lockdown. Um, uh, and therefore having to leave student accommodation because the university closure, the university had closed. But any rent reduction, whether that's a full waiving of the rent by a landlord or an agreement to defer a portion of the rent to be paid later, will need to be recorded in writing. So um, if the expectation is that the rent is only being deferred to a later point where a tenant may be in a better position to pay the rent, that needs to be clearly set out um, in writing in a, in a form of an, a, a mutually agreed um, document um, and that would set up the terms of the terms of any agreement and any expectation for the repayment of any deferred rent or indeed if it was a full waiving of the rent that um, a rent reduction then that would need to be set out set out too because in a um, in where there is a joint well, sorry where there is a ongoing tenancy agreement then the rent the rental liability of the tenant would continue 
So in this circumstance where you have one joint tenant refusing to pay, it does remain that um, the joint deposit can be used and claimed against in order to claim those rent arrears. And on this front, um, TDS are now providing a new service and we launched it recently, TDS Resolution. And this provides a service for landlords and tenants to agree um, to, to reach a mutually agreeable uh, rent repayment plan for rent arrears. And it will also serve the purpose of complying with the pre-action protocols that the courts are now requiring in respect of uh, rent claims in the private rented sector. Uh, so for more information of that on that, um, I've included the, um, the web address for the service there on the slide, but it also will be available in the information that we um, send out at the end of the webinar. So on to our fourth FAQ, which is one tenant has given notice to terminate the joint tenancy agreement. The others do not want to move out yet. Can one tenant do this and what should I do? Okay, uh, the, it depends on the situation and it depends on the, the type of tenancy agreement that is in place at the time. So where we have a fixed term agreement, uh, it is not possible for one tenant to terminate that agreement unilaterally. All joint tenants would have to act together to seek any early early end to a fixed term agreement um, whilst, whilst it is during that fixed term. However, uh, under a periodic agreement, so that's one where any fixed term has come to an end and it's continued on a rolling basis or a contractual periodic agreement. Um, and unless the tenancy agreement stipulates otherwise, under common law, it will suffice for one tenant to um, serve a notice to quit in order to end the tenancy. Um, obviously, that would need to be validly served and that would end the, any joint periodic tenancy for all tenants. Um, in either event, it, it would be important to consider what happens next. Um, so if you had um, the other tenants, as in this scenario, who did not want to move out yet, you might like to consider issuing a new tenancy agreement for those tenants, for that new combination of tenants that like we talked about earlier with tenant swaps. Um, <clears throat> and also um, consider uh, the, the, you, which inspections you would need to carry out, i.e. a checkout inspection and, and the relevant deposit administration um, to ensure that it was all done properly to end, that, end the one tenancy and begin a new one. Okay, so that is um, that was all of the FAQs that we had to run through. So um, I think we can now move on to um, our Q&A session. Uh, so for, as a final reminder, if you haven't already done so, please submit uh, any questions that have come up during the course of the, the webinar. Um, and uh, I will now hand over to Amy, who's going to have a look through um, the questions as they're coming through. Thank you very much for that, Kira. Um, as you mentioned, let's now progress into the second half of this webinar and begin the Q&A session. So we've had loads of questions coming through, so thank you very much to everyone for engaging. Please do keep them coming. Um, firstly, we have a question. Is it good practice to get a tenant to sign an agreement with me to state how much deposit I am withholding and the reasons when I do a checkout? Oh, Kira, you're on mute. <laughs> OK, yes, um, that would be good practice. TDS also provide a, a, a schedule um, template which could be used in respect of deductions being proposed for from a deposit. Um, it's always good practice to um, run through the types of issues that may have arisen during the checkout inspection for which you may um, wish to claim from the deposit for, because in principle, if you can get uh, the tenant's agreement to those um, and to any amounts that then um, are established in relation to those, then you may not need to come to dispute. But if you do, then that evidence will also be helpful. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean a tenant can't later dispute um, the deduction from the deposit, they might wish to dispute it on the, the basis the amount claimed is too high. But if you have had um, a chance to have them agree that the issue was there, i.e. There was, there was a burn mark to the carpet, they agree it was there, that's going to go a long way to supporting your evidence. Um, but also don't let that be in place of um, um, your checkout report and any photographs, so take a photo of the burn as well. Um, and all that together will be um, good evidence to the adjudicator should it be needed in the event of a dispute. Thank you very much. Um, next question we have, can scratches made by tenants within a built-in wardrobe fall within the fair wear and tear and how is this gauged? Um, I think I heard you say scratches within a wardrobe. 
Yes, correct. Um, I, um, it will depend. I think scr the word scratches implies to me that it's um, would would uh, indicate that damage has been caused caused by uh, carelessness. Likely, I think that um, light marks of use would probably fall within the scope of fair wear and tear, but scratches or gouges or something more um, uh, obviously damaging the the, the uh, sort of aesthetic of the the wardrobe uh, could well fall into the. Um, uh, into the scope of damage. I think what would also be important to consider is the condition of the wardrobe at the start of the tenancy. Um, if it was new and in really good condition, then something like that's going to um, uh, likely, more likely fall within damage. But if it, at the start of the tenancy, it was already quite scratched or marked, um, some more light scratches may not uh, fall into damage. They might be considered to be fair wear and tear, particularly if we look at if it was a long tenancy. Um, so again, it depends on, on the scope of that damage um, and, and the individual circumstances. But yes, I'd say in principle, it's quite likely to fall, fall into damage. Perfect. So another question, just on the topic of counterclaims, if a tenant is in rent arrears due to a claim that the property is unsafe, can an adjudicator assess this and make an award? Um, when the question asked if it was unsafe, I think I need to um, just cover off the possibility that if um, a um, uh, if there's been any um, involvement by the local authority, you know, such as a, a safety note, health and safety notice, um, the, the um, and that a property has been deemed uninhabitable, then that may that will have an effect on whether adjudicator can consider the effect the um, claim for rent arrears. But in principle, um, if it's complaint, if um, uh, like as I said about counterclaims earlier, if if under the tenancy agreement the rent has not been paid and that can be shown, um, then um, the adjudicator will be able to consider making an award from the deposit for rent arrears if the the counterclaim, so to speak, is in respect of complaints about the property. As I said earlier, the tenant would need to consider taking, if they wish to pursue them, those under um, uh, by separate means. Uh, but I just would issue sort of that disclaimer about whether or not the local authority had had if there was evidence to show that they had deemed the property to not be safe, then that may have an effect on whether the adjudicator can consider a claim from rent arrears, yes. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, we have a viewer attended a refresher NRLA course earlier this year and was told it is no longer acceptable to claim for cleaning from deposits, even professional cleaning. Um, sorry, Amy, could you just repeat the beginning of the question? I think I heard it right, but... Um, so a viewer has attended a refresher NRLA course right. earlier this year okay. and, and they were told it's no longer acceptable to claim for cleaning from deposits. Um, there's been no change in your entitlement to claim for cleaning where there has been um, a clear deterioration in cleanliness between the start and the end of the tenancy. However, I think perhaps what's being referred to here is the tenant's fee ban um, and insofar as... Um, it does um, effectively prohibit a tenancy agreement requiring a tenant to pay for um, a professional cleaner. So that is no longer a permitted deduction from a deposit. However, um, as the guidance on the tenant fees ban does make clear, you can still require a tenant to have a property cleaned to a professional standard if it was let in a professional standard of cleanliness at the start of the tenancy. Um, so hopefully that's helpful um, as to the advice you've been given. But uh, you are able to make claims for cleaning against the tenancy against the tenancy deposit uh, in the normal way. Great, thank you. Um, another one: My current tenants wish to stay another year. How does this affect the deposit? Um, I. I think it will depend on the circumstances. I think perhaps um, what the scenario that you're, you, that you're, you're setting out there is that the fix, a fixed term tenancy is coming to an end. Um, if you have the same joint tenants wishing to stay um, on another year, then you would likely uh, wish to um, secure in both of your interests, look at signing another fixed term agreement. Um, if the tenants are the same, the property is the same, the landlord is the same, uh, and the de tenancy deposit is the same, um, you don't need to... Uh, sign, uh, sorry, you don't need to serve new prescribed information um, or necessarily update the tenancy deposit scheme um, if there's no change to the tenancy 
in itself, um, it would be a case of um, issuing a new tenancy agreement as, as agreed between uh, you and the tenants. Should there be a change to any of those um, uh, any of those factors that I mentioned, then you might need to um, look at reserving the prescribed information with any new tenancy agreement um, and carrying out the relevant deposit administration but I, by informing the tenancy deposit scheme of any such changes. Great, thank you. Um, if the landlord raises an ADR and the tenants refuse to respond, would the landlord be awarded in full? Um, Again, it depends on the, on, the, on the circumstances. If a tenant um, just if a tenant is uncontactable um, and we're unable to contact contact them, uh, it may be that we are unable to effectively assume their consent for ADR. Um, however, if we have had the part, we have had the, you know been able to contact the parties in the first instance, and it's a case of the tenant simply um, not responding to us with their evidence and their response to the dispute. Um, then usually, as, as is set out in our terms and conditions, what we can do is make a default award, but that would only be in the, the circumstances where the tenant had been failed to respond, I think that's what you mean in the question, um, to the um, specific request for them to send in their response and their evidence, and had failed to do so within the timescales that we would, would have set out um, for them to do so. Great, thank you. Um, in a situation where damages or cleaning and rent arrears together amount to thousands more than the deposit amount, which is best to select for TDS claim, bearing in mind the rest may later go to a small claims? Um, I, I'm probably, I hesitate because I don't want to give particular legal advice on, on what, what would be successful at court and what wouldn't. Um, the TDS will, the TDS adjudicator will consider claims where they exceed the deposit in the order the adjudicator feels is most appropriate. You can, however, if you wish for the claims to be set to be considered in a certain order, um, then you can set that out in your submission and the adjudicator will follow your uh, request. Um, I think it would depend on the robustness the, um, of the strength of your evidence. If you have clear evidence that the um, tenant has responsible for rent arrears, that might be something you wish to take to court. Um, Say in the say in the, um, in the eventuality that your your you felt that your check in and check out evidence wasn't as strong for any reason, um, but um, it, I think it largely depends on your circumstances and what what evidence you have in respect to the claims as to what order you would like them to be um, and what order you'd like them to be dealt with uh, as to as to what you decide to do. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question, is it possible to deduct an amount for repair that may have been done to a washing machine, for example, as a consequence of neglect or carelessness use by the tenant? Um, it can be possible, yes. Um, I think if you're looking to deduct that amount from a deposit at the end of the tenancy, so let's say, I think what you might be set, what might be referring to is a, a repair conducted during the tenancy, um, or even if it's a repair that's required afterwards, what the adjudicator would be looking for is evidence of liability. Uh, because items like white goods can fall into requiring repair and um, for, for other maintenance reasons, which might not be the responsibility of the tenant. Um, so it's a simple maintenance, maybe a routine maintenance issue. What the adjudicator would therefore be looking in order to transfer that liability to the tenant would, would be evidence of um, the neglect, you know, or the carelessness that you refer to. Um, and what the adjudicator in, in, in particular would be looking for, um, or what we see most often, is a contractor's statement. So where you have the repair carried out, I ask the contractor to set out clearly what the problem was and what in their view was the likely cause of that. Um, so, you know, if the contractor said this is a routine maintenance thing and that was on their, their, con on their invoice, then it's unlikely the adjudicator would consider that to be the tenant's responsibility. But if it's made clear that this is because they're washing things they shouldn't have, they haven't cleaned it out regularly um, enough, and that the, the uh, contractor can state that on their documentation and you can provide that to the adjudicator, then that will help the adjudicator to make the liaison they need to make the award from the deposit. Great, thank you. Um, next question. When dealing with deductions for damages, 
Do the repairs need to be actually done and invoices provided to be able to claim or is a quote enough? Do we need to provide the tenant with a few quotes as well? Um, the short answer is yes, a quote is enough. Um, a landlord doesn't, in principle, actually have to get the work carried out um, in order to deduct an amount from the deposit. Um, it is enough, it, it would suffice for the adjudicator to see evidence that um, there's been the deterioration in either, well, it could be damage, deterioration in condition of the deck or whatever, whatever it is that you're, you're looking at. Um, what the adjudicator is looking for is evidence of that deterioration during the tenancy, that it's breached the tenancy agreement so that you have a relevant clause in the tenancy agreement. Um, and then they will look, as I said earlier, as we touched on earlier, they will look at their own assessment of, um, of the, the loss suffered and they'll take into account some of those factors that I talked about, like the age of an I the age of an item, condition of an item, fair wear and tear, length of the tenancy. Um, but having the a quote, as you know, you asked if it was it would suffice to have a quote, having a quote will give the landlord, the adjudicator, a benchmark by which to work from, and they may award that quoted amount if they deem it reasonable. They may award slightly less based on some of those factors I talked about earlier. Um, so yes, you don't you don't need to show that the work has been done necessarily, but it is very helpful to show that you've gone to the the trouble of getting a, a, a quotation or an estimate, or if it's a replacement item, an, an estimate of the cost of replacement or something like that, um, to show that you've uh, calculated what you think is likely to be a reasonable cost to you. Great. Um, so next question, a student has caused nine burn marks on a carpet in a large room. How much compensation could I claim given that a new carpet would cost about 900 pounds, but the carpet is six years old? have or was professionally cleaned every year? Okay, that's a very specific question. Um, I think, um, well, first of all, I would I would say burn marks generally amount to damage, um, depending on um, how big they are, where, you know, I think you said in the centre of the room. Um, I'm not sure, I can't remember. <laughs> um, but um, they may often justify the replacement of the carpet um, because of the, that na the, the nature of that damage is permanent. And that's clear to an adjudicator if they can be shown evidence of the burn mark. Um, so um, I think you said that the cost of replacement was £900. Um, I'm not going to give you a definite figure because what I don't know is um, you know, how extensive the burn marks were. They could have been small marks. Um, they could be rather large marks. You know, it rather depends. Um, I think, and I should make that distinction, as if they were very tiny marks, it might be that the adjudicator doesn't consider that that um, justifies the replacement of the carpet, but that they would award compensation for what they consider to be the loss in lifespan uh, and the loss in, in you know, aesthetic value. Um, but if they were very large, and they, they would, as I said, may look very likely consider that the carpet would justifiably require replacement. Um, but one, one key thing there is that you said the carpet was six years old. Um, and adjudicator will look at um, the general lifespan, uh, average lifespan um, of a carpet in a let property. A couple of things to mention here is that, um, well, first of all, TDS provides some guidance on lifespan, product lifespans, which is available on our website um, to give you a guide of how um, long an adjudicator might expect a carpet to be of useful value in a property. Um, but, and secondly, I think if you do consider that your car, particular carpet was of a much higher value um, and would have lasted a longer amount of time, then it would be important to show the adjudicator that with evidence perhaps of the original cost of the carpet or, you know, we know certain carpets will last longer yeah, based on their material. So showing evidence of that, if you expect to recoup a higher amount, would be also important. Um, but what what I will say, and you may um, be aware of that in the, in, there are industry guidelines as to how to calculate apportioned um, uh, contributions towards replacement items, um, which would take into account um, the lifespan I just mentioned, the age, which in this case was six years, um, and the and the replacement cost. So an adjudicator will have um, reference to that, and the fact that six year the carpet is six years, albeit it was in a good condition, cleaned at the start of the tenancy it remains that it would have had six years of its life elapsed, and the tenant can't be responsible for the use it's already expired before they came to damage it effectively. Uh, but but nevertheless, um, um, uh, it may well be that claim for replacement is justified on the basis of burn marks, and generally speaking, uh, it would be. 
just sort of following on from that question, we've had a question asked, is replacement cost the cost of replacing now or the cost of initial purchase? Generally speaking, the cost of replacing now. Um, that said, as I just touched on earlier, if you have an original item that's been damaged, uh, which you consider to be of particularly high value or particularly good quality, and therefore would have a higher, perhaps, lifespan than average, because adjudicator will generally work to average, um, then providing evidence of your original purchase receipt or evidence of the original quality of that product would be useful evidence. So the adjudicator can see um, that it was of a certain quality and that the loss is relatable to that higher quality rather than an average quality. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I think I've answered that question. So, <laughs> could you just repeat the question, maybe, just to check I answered that? All. Could you just repeat that last question? Do you think, please? Is the replacement cost of replacing an item the cost it took to buy it, or the cost now? Okay. Yeah, I think I have answered that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the last question we have time for today then would be, my tenants left the property leaving a lot of belongings behind. Can I charge them rent until they pick up their belongings? Um, this, um, generally speaking, um, no, but it will depend on the situation. I think in this scenario, if we have had a tenancy end and it's probably properly ended and there's no dispute about that, um, then um, rent would cease to be chargeable. But the fact that the, the belongings have been left in the property um, may give rise to a claim for removing those items, storing them, uh, disposing of them, even if you've given the tenant ample opportunity to return and collect them, because that would be at a cost to you to do so, particularly if it was um, preventing you from reletting the property. If you have a scenario where um, it's unclear if the tenancy has been ended by the tenancies or then they've just up and left and left things there and potentially not returned the keys, Not you know, the, the adequate notice hasn't been given and the tenancy hasn't been properly ended, um, then uh, it may well be that rent continues to be payable until such time as the tenancy is properly ended, belongings removed, keys returned, um, and all the administration, you know, in terms of uh, checkout, um, things like that, completed. Great, thank you. And I think let's just squeeze one last question in. Um, so someone has asked, the garden was not perfect at the start of this tenancy, weedy in places, but it is now completely overgrown. Can I claim the cost of gardening work required? Um, in short, the answer would be yes, um, but there are considerations to factor in. Um, the adjudicator would initially be looking for evidence of that deterioration in condition. If So uh, the scenario here is that it was in a generally good or certainly a better condition at the start than it ended up at the end of the tenancy being very overgrown. Um, so the adjudicator would be looking for evidence uh, and ideally this is where photographs are very useful of the condition of the garden and how it looked at the start and how it looked at the end. So once they've um, satisfied themselves that there was a clear deterioration at the overgrowth that happened during the tenancy and that was a breach of the tenancy agreement, um, then um, they should be able to consider them making an award for the cost of gardening works. However, um, I think you mentioned it wasn't perfect and was weedy. So if the, the quotation that you provide, for instance, or the invoice you provide is for, let's say, £150 to do all the gardening required in the garden, the adjudicator will very likely um, make an award for less than that based on the fact that the garden needed some amount of work, de-weeding or whatever it was at the start of the tenancy, before the tenancy started. And that is something that the tenant cannot be held responsible for. So I think you probably get a majority award there, but you would, there would certainly be some um, level of reduction made for the weeds that you mentioned at the start of the tenancy. Thank you very much for answering all those questions, Kira. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So I'll now pass over to yourself for the final slide. Thanks, Amy. Um, yes, and um, thank you all for um, listening. Hopefully the, the answers to the questions have been helpful. Um, and um, we have just collated a, sl a slide to finish with where you can access further information on, on some of the subjects we talked about today, um, uh, particularly in relation to tenancy deposit disputes and renting to students. Um, you will receive, there's some uh, guidance and the names of some guidance documents that we do provide on our website are all there in the slide 
Um, and you'll be provided that information as well in the uh, email, which will come out to you uh, following the end of the uh, webinar. So thank you very much for joining us today. And I'll just hand back to Amy um, to finish off the webinar. Brilliant. As Kira said, thank you very much to everyone again for being able to attend this webinar. Also, a big thank you, Kira, for the presentation and answering everyone's questions in our Q&A session. The webinar recording will be made available and emailed to you in due course, so look out for that. If you could also look out for our one question feedback poll at the end of the webinar, that would be greatly appreciated. This enables TDS to constantly improve their webinar content. All that's left for me to say is thank you once again, and we look forward to welcoming you on another TDS webinar very soon. Goodbye.